Great day, brothers. My great joy to bring to you God's Word today. If you have your Bibles with you, turn out with me to Ruth chapter 3. For more than a year now, we have been in lockdown, particularly if you are in the Philippines. Our government used different acronyms for it, such as ECQ, MECQ, GCQ, and MGCQ. And now, we have what we call NCR Bubble Plus uh, to contain the spread of COVID-19. Vaccines started to roll out, but there are some delays because of the global demand that we are experiencing. And now with the rising cases of people contracting COVID-19 every day, we are still in lockdown. And a lot are uncertain about what's going to happen for tomorrow. Many Filipinos are actually asking, is there hope even in the midst of pandemic that we are experiencing? Is there hope? The book of Ruth shares a similar concern where the writer is actually trying to ask and look for hope in the midst of what they experience, particularly for Naomi and Ruth. The book of Ruth started with these lines in chapter 1, In these days when the judges ruled. It signifies how Israel, God's chosen people, intentionally and deliberately rebelled against God. Israel was in complete chaos. There was leadership crisis, civil unrest, and turning away from God. But despite of all those things, God didn't stop. In pursuing them. God redeemed them from idolatry to worshiping the true God. And in the book of Ruth, we see a glimpse of hope. A hope that was promised to the chosen people of God. That they will experience the presence of God and that they will experience joy and satisfaction. And here in the book of Ruth, it's more than just a love story of Boaz and Ruth. We see here God's providence working behind the scenes to remind his people that he is still fully in control even in our worst situations. And he can use and turn failures and obedience to unfold his plan of redemption. And zooming into the big picture, we see hope that is not dependent on what's happening in us or around us, but we see hope that is rooted and founded in the steadfast love of God for His people. We also see God's love threading through the lives of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Join me in a short prayer. Father, we ask that you will speak to us and we ask that your word will illumine and steer genuine hope, courage, and confidence in our God. May you be gracious to grant to us your way as we follow you. In Christ I pray, amen. The sermon is entitled, Radical Plan, Radical Providence, and Promise. In Ruth chapter 3, we see the radical plan of Naomi, together with the radical obedience of Ruth. Second, we're going to see the radical providence of God. And third, we see the radical promised redeemer in the life of Boaz. Let's start. First, we see the radical strategic plan of Naomi. We can see that in verses 1 to 5. And there we read, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well be with you? Is it not Boaz a relative with whose young women you were? See, he is renewing barley tonight at the threshing floor. 
Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Then you, here we see the strategic plan of Naomi. Okay. Now we need to understand that Naomi started in chapter 1 verse 20 calling herself Mara. Because the Almighty has dealt with her bitterly. What happened to her in chapter 1? She lost her husband. She lost her sons and almost nothing left to her but Ruth. They actually escaped okay, God's place because there was a famine and they were looking for fortune in other places. And when they are going back to Bethlehem, he said those words. She said those words, I am Mara. It's like God has abandoned me. God is not with me me so she came to bethlehem with full of disappointments frustrations and even shame of becoming a widow but things started to change when she witnessed god's kindness to her and ruth and we see that in chapter 2 naomi said to ruth after learning about boaz in ruth chapter 2 verse 20 may he be blessed be by the lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to Ruth, The man is a close relative of ours and one of our redeemers. Now see what happened to Naomi from chapter 1 where she was in despair and now coming to chapter 2, hope started to rise. Well, particularly not because of what Boaz is doing, but based from the very words of Naomi in chapter 2, you see there that the Lord has not forsaken the living or the dead. It's the kindness of the Lord that has propelled now Naomi to come up with a strategic plan in verses 1 to 4. Naomi had hope. And this is what actually enables her to do this strategic plan for Ruth. Even Naomi said that Boaz was one of their kinsmen. It was her plan for Ruth to secure her through a redeemer and for them not to be any more empty. So in this plan, in verses 1 and 2, Naomi said, I am going to do something for you, my daughter-in-law. Then this plan is actually to uh, send Ruth to Boaz in the threshing floor. Then in verse 3, Naomi instructed Ruth to bathe herself, dress, and go to the threshing floor where Boaz will actually spend the night winnowing. Winnowing is taking off the dust and the shaft of the grain. And this strategic plan of Naomi for Ruth, also, if you're going to look at some the historical context, you're going to see that there are some tensions to it. Because Ruth was also in danger in going to the threshing floor alone. She could have been taken advantage by other men or strangers. Actually, one commentator named Dean Ulrich in his book, from famine to fullness, he commented that Naomi was risking Ruth for going to the threshing floor. And I quote, Naomi put Ruth in real danger because threshing floors lay outside the town. Ruth could have been abducted on the way and never made it to Boaz. He added, Naomi put both Ruth and Boaz at risk of yielding to temptation or being unjustly accused of sex scandal. End quote. Because in their time, prostitutes would, would offer their services at such places. But here's what I'd like you to understand in Naomi's radical plan, strategic plan that 
she is trying to lay down for Ruth. For Naomi, oh, I, can, I think for sure she knew how dangerous it was to send Ruth to the threshing floor by herself. But we need to look how the whole narrative flows in the book of Ruth. It was when the time where people were driven to do what they wanted out of selfish desires and personal glory. In the days when they were ruled by the judges, people are rebelling against God. And in it, God was never part. Yet, Naomi's plan was not based on her gut feeling. She was taking initiative based from God's word. Naomi was actually following God's directive law, specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 5 to 6. Let me read it for you. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And there we see the kinsman redeemer actually delivering and rescuing the widow and at the same time providing everything the family needs, which was, which was actually lost in the case of death of the brother. So Naomi was taking radical obedience here. He understand, she understood the risk. But in verse 4, at the same time, she deliberately instructed Ruth. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Naomi was not just familiar with God's law, she was also familiar and aware about the customs of the Jewish when they had it when it comes to looking for a kinsman redeemer. Naomi had a radical plan, strategic plan for Ruth, but not rooted on selfish desires and motive, but rooted in God's directive law and will. And Naomi was holding fast to God's word because of what God has previously done in chapter 2, verse 20. Now we see in verse 5, daughter-in-law followed Naomi. She said to Naomi, all that you say, I will do. And here, I'd like you to also understand that Ruth's obedience to Naomi was marked by hope that is grounded in God's love. Remember how Boaz commented her in chapter 2, verses 11 to 12? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people you did not know before. By the Lord, uh, the Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. That's where Ruth was coming from. That's why she followed the instructions of Naomi. Now, what can we learn from Naomi and Ruth? Naomi had a strategic plan. Ruth took a righteous risk. And their plan and risk were both rooted in the hope that they have in God. They weren't paralyzed by fear or despair. Their actions were filled with hope and courage. When almost everyone in Bethlehem were doing the things that they want and not rooted in God, here we see women seeking to do God's will, seeking to do God's desire, so that they may find joy in Him and that God may be glorified. Naomi and Ruth were at the same time learning to trust God in the events of their lives, despite of the situation that they experience and despite of the culture 
that they have during the time. Are we trusting God in these uncertain times? Are you trusting God? And are you placing your life in His will? Are you ready to risk it for the sake of your joy and God's glory? In verses 1 to 5, we see the radical plan rooted in the hope of God. Second, we see radical providence. We see that in verses 6 to 13. Now, we see that after Ruth said to Naomi that she's going to uh, follow everything that she said, Ruth went to the threshing floor. She waited for Boaz to finish winnowing. And Boaz, in his ordinary schedule of winnowing, did not expect Ruth's untimely visit. In verse 7, we see there that Ruth came softly and uncovered Boaz's feet and lay down. Now, ESV Study Bible says that that very action of what Ruth did uh, would mean to uncover his feet feet and lie down there will demonstrate her dependence on Boaz. It sometimes suggests that his feet is an expression for sexual contact, but there is no evidence for this, and it will be out of place in this story. Keep in mind that Ruth and Boaz didn't commit fornication, as you're going to see in the next few verses. There was real temptation and awkwardness along the way, but they didn't pursue that. If we're going to continue with the narrative, Boaz actually asked, Who are you? Then Ruth answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, what is Ruth trying to say here? She expressed now her desire to submit to Boaz, to be kept, to be protected, and to be taken care for. A Moabite is submitting her life to an Israelite man, a worker in the field, righteously risking her life to the owner of the field. A young woman boldly coming to an older man, not a usual thing in their culture. Such a risky plan and move. But I'd like you to connect chapter 3 verse 9 to chapter 2 verse 12. Remember, we, we mentioned this a while ago. But keep in mind, this is where Ruth is coming from. He, uh, Ruth heard this from Boaz. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. It's like Ruth is now echoing the very words that Boaz authored to Ruth. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Ruth emphasized that to Boaz. You are a redeemer. See God's providence in the ris risky plan where Ruth agreed to do for Naomi. Now, we need to understand when we talk about providence, somehow we need to unpack it. Now, what does it mean? Uh, in Genesis chapter 22, you see there God's challenge for Abraham when he asked him to sacrifice Isaac. And when they were on the top of the mountain, when it was time for him to uh, kill his son, God stopped Abraham and provided a ram for Abraham. And there you see in Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. The word providence comes from that word. As it said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. 
when you think about God's providence, you see you see God providing for us explicitly or not explicitly. Let's take a look at at uh, an old catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism, question number 27. And let's let's see how it unpacks the word providence. The almighty and everywhere present power of God, whereby, as it were, by his hand, he still upholds heaven and earth with all creatures, and so governs them that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty, ye all things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. Take note of that. All things come not by chance, but by his fatherly hand. That's what's happening in Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. All these things that are taking place are not by chance. It's by the hand of the sovereign triune God. Then the Catechism continues in question 28. What's the benefit of knowing God's providence even in this turmoil that we are experiencing? That we may be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and for what is future, have good confidence in our faithful God and Father, and no creature shall separate us from his love, since all creatures are so in his hand that without his will they cannot so much as move. That's what's happening in the very lives of the characters in the book of Ruth. Their actions were not out of chances. They were, they were not risking, not knowing what's uh, the promise of God is they are taking righteous risks, particularly for Ruth, because she starts to see the hand of God moving in their lives. Brothers, do you see God's providence in your life right now? Do you see what God is doing in the season of pandemic? Even now that we are in ECQ season 2. This is not out of chance. Our government may lack some initiatives and actions in preventing these rises of COVID-19. But please keep in mind that the hand of God is still upon us. He's reaching out to us. So see God's loving hand reaching out to us, drawing us near to his presence, that we may see him and have hope, that in him we have life, that in him we have everything we need, that in him we can make strategic plans to grow in our walk with God, that in him we can make righteous risks that will show God's faithfulness and glory. And that's what Ruth did. Now, in verses 10 to 13, I'd like you to see how Boaz responded to Ruth's request. In verse 10, Boaz said to Ruth, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. <laughs> in his next words, uh, he, he said, actually, parang, parang kay, he, uh, he told Ruth, uh, Why me, Ruth? I'm already an old man and you're a young woman. But he continued, you made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Then in verse 11, Boaz commends Ruth as a worthy woman. And the word a worthy woman is similar to Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10, where an excellent wife who can find it. She is far more precious than jewels. So, so Boaz was also seeing the godliness in Ruth. Yeah, Ruth was taking the righteous risk, but Boaz is also seeing the genuineness of her heart. 
spread your wings to me because you are a redeemer. Then in verse 12, Boaz drop, drops the climax of Ruth's hope. And Boaz said, and now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yes, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Well, if you're Ruth, what will be your reaction? How would you respond? But you'll see here again the providence of God coming. And when, when, when your hope is more than in the circumstances, but in the very words of God, it will actually change how you respond. We're going to see that later. Boaz was an honorable man and did not take advantage of Ruth's proposal. But he said, yet... There is a Redeemer nearer than I. Then Boaz said, Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives. So you see now again the providence of God here. As the Lord lives, I will redeem you. See again how hope rises in the heart of Ruth. She came there taking a righteous risk, asking one of the Redeemers, asking the Redeemer to actually take care of her, to spread her uh, his wings to her, and learning that there's someone else okay, who's also a Redeemer, but also giving hope at this time. As the Lord lives, I will redeem you if he's not willing. Then Boaz said, lie down until the morning. God in his sovereign work that night sets Ruth's heart right. He is teaching Ruth to wait for the true kinsman to redeem her. And Boaz was also learning to wait upon the Lord. No rush. They were both learning to trust in God's providence. Brothers, when we learn to trust in God's radical providence, He gives us comfort and peace that His ways are better than us. The things that are happening in us are not out of chances. It's not like God is playing games with you. He is after your joy. And that joy comes from sanctifying your heart, your mind, and your actions. And from there, seeing God's hand at work fully in you. And also, I'm reminded that even as I'm talking to you, God's providence would remind us that He is for us. He's not against us. That God's providence would also remind you that He is in us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is in us. And I believe that's what God was trying to place in the hearts of Ruth and Boaz that time. And even for Naomi, he was waiting for her daughter-in-law. So we see radical plan. Radical providence. Lastly, in verses 14 to 18, we see the radical promised redeemer. So Boaz kept to himself what just happened that night to keep Ruth's integrity. We see in verse 14, So she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. You know, Boaz could have taken advantage of the situation knowing that it was Ruth who actually came to her, but we have seen a gentle and lowly kinsman redeemer trusting in the Lord's way. Then before Ruth left, Boaz measured out six measures of barley and gave it to Ruth. He has been showing to her what it looks like to actually spread his wings under Ruth. This is not actually the first time. We also see that in chapter 2. The goodness and kindness that Boaz showed to Ruth. Now, now, Seeing all these things coming together, I'm also reminded of what took place in chapter 2, verse 13. 
where Ruth responded to Boaz, I have found favor in your eyes, my lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not your servant. Now, clearly, Boaz had, uh, had options to actually just shoo Ruth that night or even not give something to her when, uh, when she left. But all the kindness and goodness that Boaz was showing Ruth is sheer grace. And we need also to understand that when we look at this kind of narrative, we see Christ in the life of Boaz. He is the promised Redeemer. And in Boaz, Naomi and Ruth didn't deserve any kind of treatment from him. And Boaz was actually showing to them the steadfast love of God to his people. That despite of their disobedience, despite of their neglect of God, God pursues them. God redeems them. God fills them. But we also see that in the very providence of God. And what Boaz just did is a showcase of God's grace to sinners like you and me. The promised Redeemer here is Boaz. And while they're waiting, Ruth and Naomi were also patiently waiting. And when Ruth came home, she told everything what happened with her and Boaz that night. And in verse 17, these six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, here's what Ruth said, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Now, you might think that Naomi would, would be disappointed of uh, what took place that night as Ruth was retelling the stories. But you need to keep in mind that God is also trying to communicate something to Naomi at this, this time. From the very words of uh, Boaz, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. What was, what was God trying to teach Naomi at this very moment? Remember Ruth chapter 1 verses 20 to 21 when she said, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. What is God telling Naomi now? God is telling Naomi that through the very act of Boaz, God is telling her, you are not empty. See God's providence in the promised kinsman redeemer. The root of Naomi's strategic and practical plan is addressed by God's providence. And God meets her where she was to remind her that God did not forget her. That God was in her, with her, in the midst of her pain and trial. And you think about what Naomi, how she responded when she heard those words from Ruth, from Boaz. You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Oh, what kind of hope did that produce at the very words of the promised Redeemer? And that's also the hope that God instills into our hearts when we hear God's word. For the past few months, I, I would admit that there were times that I was anxious, fearful about the things that are taking place uh, in our country. And as uh, cases are getting closer to home, where your friends are getting COVID, some of your church families are getting COVID, 
you ask, are you with us, Lord? Are you doing something here? Just looking at the very story of Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz, you see that God is not forgetting us. He is with us still. And His words would remind us, Psalm 46, that He is your refuge, strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Oh, that rises hope in my heart. And He reminds me as well in the last verse in Psalm 46 that uh, in Him I can be still and know that He is Lord. The promise Redeemer in Christ gives hope and peace so that we may realize God's steadfast love to us. You know, if we're going to wrap up our time together and see how things are uh, coming together, there's, aside from God's hope and providence, and I think these are all connected uh, women together. You see also God's steadfast love to Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. The strategic plan of Naomi and the plan was addressed by God's providence. When you reflect on Ruth's obedience and abiding in God's presence, when you see, when you reflect on Boaz's response to Ruth's request, you see the on-time redemption of God in them, in, in, in the midst of turmoil and desperation. All those things are shaped and wrapped in God's steadfast love for them. God's providence, God's hope, God's steadfast love, love these are the things that are shaping the very heart of God's people so that we may understand that He is for our joy and at the same time for His glory. That in all these things, our hearts may be drawn to Him, may be drawn back to His presence and delight and see and taste for what it is. As we end, In God's providence, He shows His kindness, faithfulness, grace, mercy, and compassion to Naomi and Ruth. And it's wrapped, like what I said, in one word to describe God's covenant of love to His people. Has said, or the steadfast love of God. In Naomi's plan, Ruth's obedience, God was faithful to save them from their misery. God's loving kindness to His people is channeled through Boaz. To be given to Naomi and Ruth. And here's what I'd like us to also take away. We see here the story of Christ. Through Boaz. That Jesus Christ is greater than Boaz. That in Christ, fast forward, God's steadfast love is extended to undeserving people like you and me. We are recipients of God's unwavering faithfulness and goodness in Jesus Christ. In Christ, we are full and not empty-handed. We have everything we need in Jesus Christ. But don't think much of the material and physical needs Jesus, through His perfect life and sacrifice on the cross and triumph resurrection, we get to experience the very presence of God in Him. We get to experience the steadfast love, has said love of God for us. We get to experience hope that is in Christ. We get to experience God's providence that He is for us and He is with us. So my hope that is that in this chapter 3, as we have seen the radical plan, the radical uh, providence, and the radical promise, I hope that you see this all together knitted in God's sovereign love, providence, and hope. That as believers, we can also 
bank and root ourselves into the very good and promises of our God. Regardless if this lockdown is going to continue for many years, regardless if COVID-19 is not going to be eradicated, regardless of what's going to happen in the future, be reminded, take heart, take righteous risk and plan, rooted in the very heart of God, for our joy and for our glory. God bless you. Father, we thank you for your word. And may you give us courage to follow you, to depend on you, to abide in you. For our joy and your glory. Christ, I pray.